the third in the series of talks in which we'd like to consider whether the biblical account of Genesis in the light of modern science can be taken seriously. And ask the question, is after the first few chapters of Genesis being proven as unreasonable by modern science, or can we take the Bible at its word and believe in six days of creation 6,000 years ago? In this presentation, we'll be looking at the rocks beneath our feet to see what they can tell us about the history of our planet and life upon it. And we'll be asking that question, is millions of years of geological time and evolution as described by science, proved by the record of the rocks, or can the creation account of the Bible uh, be, still be believed? So these are our choices, the geological column with layers of lock, rock, laid down over millions of years, gradually a development. Is that a sensible consideration of the evidence we see in the rocks? Or can we still believe, some would say, is an old and out of date book? We won't in this series be able to look at all the evidence, but we'll hope to provide enough for you to be able to make a decision on what is a reasonable choice for you. We'd also like to consider if there's a middle way is it possible to hold a position where we accept that science tells us how the world was created um, and that God did the work? It's often called theistic evolution. So that's a big subject and we'll never be able to look at all the aspects of it, but we hope, and hope to open your mind to the possibilities to consider the subject, we'll split it down into various parts. There'll be some overlap between, between these parts, and it won't be until we get to the very end that we'll be able to make some conclusions. So we hope that you'll stay with us through, through the series. In the last presentation, we looked at the complexity of life and concluded that the, the suggestion that a single protein even could come into existence by chance was unreasonable. And that the simplest forms of life need about 75 protein amongst many other complex molecules to make them work. So the idea put forward by science that life started spontaneously is really without support with the evidence. And to start with, I would like to point out we don't profess to have the answer to every problem. Though we respectfully claim that neither does science. We'll try and be fair when we come to these problems and present the evidence so you can come to your own conclusion. Though clearly we hope with us that you'll agree that there is sufficient evidence to make the biblical account a rational conclusion. So uh, to our consideration in this presentation, the record in and of the rocks. And we want to con continue our considerations here as it builds on conclusions of the last two classes and starts to build an alternative narrative to support it, which is supported, we believe, by the evidence. Now, the current position that science takes is that process we see today are key to understanding the past. That is, general and slow and gradual processes. That the Earth, as we've said previously, is about four and a half billion years old. That life started about 3.7 billion years ago and then suddenly expanded at the Cambrian explosion about 540 million years ago into what we might recognise today as life and even ecosystems. And that this record in the rocks have been accumulating at the same time as the rocks slowly built up over the layers. Now the alternative position then, as we've said, is that the Bible account gives creation in six days, about 6,000 years ago. And in fact, this was shaped by a catastrophic event about four and a half thousand years ago. But on the face of it, these two views are just not compatible. How can we take the biblical view seriously in the light of modern scientific discoveries? So let's look at the scientific position to start with. Now we've met these two gentlemen a few times before now, and neither of them were the first to propose their theories for which their names have become famous. But perhaps their works more than any other started to move towards the currently generally accepted scientific position. 
Charles Lars's book, the, Geo the looked at geology and suggested that the rocks were laid down slowly over a long period of time. And this gave room for Darwin's theory of evolution as the origin of species. And both men, as a premise for their work, started with the idea that what we could see around us was, was not the result of the creator, but of natural processes. So Lyle proposed that the layers of the rocks represented millions of years of slow and gradual deposition. And Darwin, that natural gentle pressure and competition and chance mutations were sufficient for life to develop into the forms of, and complexity that we see today, even our very selves. And both men proposed that the fossil record supported that evidence. So in this presentation, we want to look with an open mind at the evidence and to consider two lines of inquiry. We want to consider that the show that the natural processes we see today and ask the question, are they a reasonable answer to the riddle presented in the geological column beneath our feet? And then we'll look at the fossil record and ask the same, does it fit with the theory of evolution, which we are told quite forcibly by science that is no longer theory, but is fact. So how did Lyle come to his conclusion? Well, it's an appealing theory, isn't it? When we look at all those layers of rocks and see what's going on around us today, it seems to fit. But in this presentation, we'd like to look a little more closely at the evidence and see if it is a reasonable conclusion, or are there other possibilities that could quite reasonably support be supported by the evidence. We're going to do this by taking a number of challenges at the current explanation that science provides and seeing if they fit. So to maintain some continuity with previous presentations and because it's particularly convenient, we'll start again with a Grand Canyon and a diagram which you've seen before. Here we can see a bit of the scale of the sedimentary layers in the geological column. A sedimentary rock, for those that are not familiar, is a term for rocks that are laid down, usually by water, layer on layer. Mm -hmm. Let's start by looking at the Coconino Grand Sandstone, which is at, near the top of the diagram you can see, and here is shown on this photograph. It's the pale layer in the red rock, uh, just above the red rock in the photograph. So here we can see the Coconino sandstone has been traced and can be found over most of central and eastern USA. Now that layer is hundreds of feet thick and it was eroded at some other place and deposited by water in this area, which is a lot bigger process than anything we see going on today. In fact, it's about 20,000 cubic miles of sand. Now that's a lot. But let's look a look again at the Kebab limestone, which overlays the Coconino limestone. And here we can see that layer passes over most of USA as it is today. It can also be traced up into Canada and Alaska and over to Greenland. And then over the Atlantic into Africa and all the way to the Middle East as far as Israel. That's an enormous area. And just for a bit of variety and to bring it closer to home, here in the UK we're very familiar with the White Cliffs of Dover, which are a chalk formation, another lock, rock laid down in water. Now these chalk layers can be traced throughout England and France and Northern Ireland, but also as far east as Kazakhstan, that's almost as far as China, and over the Atlantic Ocean back west to Nebraska in the middle of the USA. So it seems then that sedimentary sedimentation has generated these layers of rock that we've been looking at. It's an enormous process, eroding and moving and depositing huge volumes of rock, unthinkable in the terms of today's processes. Maybe we need to think of something bigger, something much grander, something on a global scale. <laughs> 
So let's look again at those layers of rock. And here they are again in the Grand Canyon. We can see the layers dead flat, both sharp, over vast areas. But this is a bit of a case of not seeing the wood for the trees, because the very existence of the Grand Canyon in this landscape presents a problem. The Grand Canyon is an example, on a grand scale, of processes of weathering and water runoff and such like that cut into the layers previously laid down, breaking up those dead flatter lines and exposing the layers so that we can see them. Now, if it did take millions of years to lay down those layers by sedimentation that then became rock, where's the evidence of all that geological activity over the same period? The layers should not be pan flat with razor sharp boundaries between them, that there should be evidence of the weathering, the water runoff, the gullies and the valleys, and even canyons between the layers that are just not there. So that we can see these razor sharp boundaries looks more like a rapid deposition of one layer upon another with very little time between the layers for, er for erosion. Perhaps the layers were deposited quickly in succession, one over the other, and um, maybe by a world global scale event as we previously looked at in the last challenge. Okay, let's look at those boundaries again this time in a bit more detail. We've been looking at layers hundreds of feet thick up to now. But let's look closer. And the closer we get, we find the layers that still exist, right down until they're just a few millimetres thick. And all the time, dead sharp, totally flat and undisturbed. So again, if these layers were laid down over extended periods of time, Where's the evidence of activity? Worms and crabs and all sorts of burrowing animals, large and small, and plants diving their roots through the layers should turn over them in a very short order. It's known as bioturbation, but there's no evidence of it. It's almost like those thin layers were laid down very quickly, one after the other again, without any of the activity that we see in the world today. So, can catastrophic events produce the sorts of features we see in the rocks beneath our feet? Again, Mount St. Heavens is an, an event that we've considered in previous presentations. It occurred in May 1980, so it was observed and recorded using modern techniques, and it has changed the, our understanding of what a catastrophic event can achieve in very short periods of time. The top 1,300 feet of the mountain blew away in one morning and hundreds of square miles of the surrounding area were covered and deposited with mud and ash up to 600 feet thick. The old landscape was swept aside and a new one laid down. The area of the blast can be seen here in the yellow, about 20 miles, 20 to 25 miles from the crater itself. The deposits were made by repeated pyroplastic flows over a period of just nine hours and made layers just like we've been looking at in the Grand Canyon that we assumed had taken a long time to develop. But mud flows that followed did even more damage and they reached much further than the blast. About two years after melted ice that had been buried in the original eruption broke loose and flowed down the sides of the mountain, reaching 50 to 60 miles from the crater itself, laying down more layers as they went. But these mud flows cut through old rocks from previous historic eruptions and the new deposits from the current uh, event and remodeled the landscape. In fact, it made a 1 40th scale version of the Grand Canyon in just one day. Now massive as this event was, it was small scale compared with events that we know have taken past in the, in the past. We'll look at that in a moment. So could the Grand Canyon have been formed quickly by a catastrophic event 
well, it appears so. In fact, more than that, because the Colorado River is not a very good explanation for the existence of the canyon. Because the plain through which the, ca the canyon cuts is actually higher than the headwaters of the river. So the river must have started by flowing uphill. And the sediment which has been you know, removed to form the canyon is not in the right place at all. It should be, it's not there. And as we've seen here, the catastrophic events produce canyons just like the Grand Canyon or very similar features to what we see in the Grand Canyon today. So let's have a look at some events from the past. It's very clear that geological activity we see today is small scale compared with the past events that have happened on our planet. Ash is found over much of the USA from the Yellowstone mega volcano eruptions. And in India, lava flows each 20 foot thick, adding up to thousands of feet, and cover about a third of the soil the subcontinent. So it seems that activities we see today are only echoes of what's happened in the past. Now we've been talking about sedimentary rocks which are laid, understood to have been laid down underwater. So are the current oceans a help to us understanding this process? Well not really. The current ocean floor is a totally different to the lands that make up the continents. While the continents are mostly sedimentary rock, the oceans are pretty much totally igneous rock, that is, volcanic rock. Now, Antonio Pellegrini was the first imagined a supercontinent back in the 1800s. In fact, he lived at a very similar time to our friend Darwin. But he imagined this event of the one massive continent splitting up as an explanation to what happened in the flood. So the continents moved across the Earth's surface very quickly. But this soon became out of date when people started to think about an old Earth. But the idea came back into fashion after World War II when submarine warfare maps were made available to geologists. And the current theory of plate tectonics was established and is now accepted, although with much slower speeds of movement. Sea oceans today do not explain the land masses that we see around us. They are made by a completely different process. Now this is a feature that we've been looking at, but not discussed, the Great Unconformity. It's an abrupt change in geology. You can see here some old geology. The layers laid down by some previous processes tilted at an angle, were then cut off, planed away, and laid over by new layers. The old layers are cut off dead flat by some later event. The feature can be inspected close up in the Grand Canyon and then traced over enormous areas within the canyon itself. But it was first found in 1787 or described by a gentleman called James Hutton, who found it in Scotland in the UK. So it looks like this feature is worldwide. In fact, it has been traced throughout the world. So let's turn to our second area of inquiry, the record of the fossils in the same rocks that we've been talking about. Does it comply with the theory of evolution? Well, it is obvious that there's a progression of plants and animals within the record. And on the face of it, it looks like the progression we would expect from evolution. But is this the case? Is there a, another interpretation of these evidences that we see? Let's have a look in a bit more detail. Again, we'll take a series of challenges and find out whether they comply with our expectations. Poly straight fossils. Poly means many and straight, in this case, straight through. And here we see a tree like uh, structure protruding through many layers of rock. It's actually a bit like today's horsetail ferns, but on a much larger scale. And it's from the Joggings Foundation 
uh, formation in Pennsylvania. And here we can see a photograph of that formation. And we can see there are hundreds and hundreds of layers of rock representing under the normal uh, idea many thousands and thousands of years of sedimentary buildup. So is it reasonable that one plant could stand up for all that time where the rocks slowly formed around it? Well, it's clearly it's not, especially when we think it's not really a tree, but more like a horsetail fern. Let's have a think about the Cambrian explosion. This again is something we've looked at before. Now diversity before disparity is a scientific way of saying the evolutionary model. We would expect one animal to come first. This then would evolve into many animals, um, of, sorry, many shapes of the same animal before eventually making different animals. But is that what we see? Well, not really. See, the Cambrian explosion, right at the start, we saw a massive disparity. A huge explosion of lots of different sorts of animals right from the beginning. And these all appeared in the geological column and continued virtually unchanged until they disappeared again. So if we wanted to draw a tree of a relationship between all of these animals, well, it wouldn't be a tree really. It would be a line of sticks all interconnected with each other. So the Cambrian explosion, we find 21 species of arthropods, all from the Burgess Shale, all appearing at the same moment in the geological record. Now the Burgess Shale is a particularly fine uh, rock for preserving fossils and they're found in exquisite detail. And arthropods are invertebrate animals having a skeleton on the outside of their body and segmented body bodies with jointed pair pairs of arms like crabs and lobsters and scorpions and spiders and centipedes and insects. So these 21 species of arthropods represented 20 different classes of arthropod and we only have five classes today and four of them are here, the crabs and lobsters, scorpions and spiders, centipedes and insects. So let's think a bit more detail about the way that uh, creatures are found in the geological record. Do we see them developing slowly in the way we do expect? Well, not really. In fact, we find them suddenly totally formed as individual animals. Here we see uh, a trilobite and a second sort of trilobite, very similar to the first. Both have compound eyes, similar to what we find in a Dragonfly today, in fact, incredibly complicated structures there right from the beginning. And only afterwards do the trilobites suddenly slowly start to diversify into different forms and shapes that we see in the record. So totally the wrong way around if we were to expect the evolutionary uh, trees to have taken form. Let's think about footprints. Many footprints of animals are being preserved. And here we have some of a trilobite, or they are thought to be from a trilobite. Now the footprints from the animals appear many feet below the animals themselves in the geological common, which is not really what you'd expect, is it? It's as if the footprints were suddenly preserved by some catastrophic event, which only later captured the animals, which should themselves be a lot easier to preserve being hard bodied. So it explains something different or suggests something different to the standard expectation. Carrying on with this thought of animals in the column, the evolutionary tree should predict the order that fossils first appear when they're found in the layers below their feet. In other words, so we see the tree branching, the first branches should appear first in the column. But that's not what we find. Only about 5% of fossils appear at the first appearance as we'd expect them to be. So 95% of fossils appear more randomly through the column. 
that's a bit odd. We wouldn't really expect that, would we? But what of those 5% of fossils that do comply with the evolutionary expectations? Well, they're ones that come from a marine to a terrestrial environment. In other words, that would suggest a development from land to sea, as indeed we are told that evolution was, that uh, animals grew legs and learned to breathe uh, air and eventually became from sea animals to terrestrial animals. Perhaps another way of explaining that would be, imagine an event that started in the sea and progressively buried first sea uh, wetlands and eventually moved on to dry lands. When we look at and suggest that that is the case, then we find an extraordinary match between the evidence uh, that we'd expect and the evidence we find in the rocks. Now, there are six mega sequences in the earth beneath our feet. And that, strangely enough, there are six major extinction events that are expected uh, by, uh, by the evidence that, that scientists produce for us. But is there another way that these could be thought of? Well, the layers in the rocks and the continents are not always together and they're never in the oceans. And the lowest layers contain marine creatures and organisms re representing marine ecosystems. As we go higher up, we find layers of land animals. However, they're mixed together, we see creatures as if a global catastrophic event was the cause that started in the sea and buried then land animals. Let's think in another way, because this would help to explain many of the things that we do see around us. Here we see a photograph from the Dinosaur National Monument fossil bone quarry in Utah in the USA. There are 11 types of dinosaurs all buried together and mixed up. But also amongst them are crocodiles, turtles, lizards and clams. In other words, animals from wet environments and sea creatures and it's quite normal to find shellfish amongst bone yards for dinosaurs. The vast majority of fossils appear to be buried in water. And this is certainly the expectation of science. But also this seems to suggest a quick bury, burial for many of the animals, as if they drowned. They're often found with their necks arched back, as if they were gasping for air. That last picture is Archaeopteryx, a famous uh, alleged missing link. But many of the fossils also seem to be doing natural everyday things. Well, that's the case for marine fossils at least. For many marine fossils are found, like this one having its dinner, or this one giving birth. They seem to have been caught out by the sudden catastrophe which came upon them. But others could see it coming. In the mid USA, there are bone yards of many thousands of dinosaurs, all buried together like a huge herd. But if it was a herd, then surely the whole family should be represented. But what we find is there are no young. Maybe they could see it coming, and the adults and the adolescents were able to run away, and the young were left behind, and then the catastrophe overtook them all. Now it's actually quite difficult to become a fossil. If you were a little creature and you wanted to become a fossil, these are the things that you would have to avoid. First of all, you mustn't be eaten while you were alive, because then you wouldn't be a fossil. But also, you mustn't be eaten while you were dead, which is obviously much more difficult to avoid. And most dead creatures today are cleaned up by scavengers. And then you must avoid aerobic decomposers. These are the things that breathe air and decompose flesh and bone very effectively in the modern world. But you must also avoid anaerobic decomposers. These are decomposers that happen deeper in the ground that don't need air, just slower, but are still very effective. And then you must lay undisturbed over a great deal of time, avoiding any geological activity. 
When we think about all those things, it's surprising that any fossils were made at all. And yet we have fossils of jellyfish here, and we've seen some of animal footprints. In fact, it is something quite special that creates fossils, an unusual event we don't see happening today. Now, in the last 15 years, this has been taken seriously. Mary Schwarzen, who raised the issue in 2005 when she wrote in the scientific press and found soft tissue in dinosaur bones, a T Rex that was unearthed in Montana. That's staggering to think that there could be soft tissue in dinosaur bones. We think them as rock, don't we? And since then, there have been many finds of the same things cells and blood vessels and proteins in dinosaur bones. In fact, Nature magazine in a paper in 2015 wrote that it was common to find soft tissue in dinosaur remains assumed to be 65 to 80 million years old. That's amazing, isn't it, really? It doesn't really make sense, does it? So, science has given us a story how the rocks and the fossils came about. And to start with, it looked reasonable. But as we've dug a little deeper, we've found problems. So have we proved that God made the world and everything in it? I don't think so, so far. But in the first presentation, we chipped away at the foundation, the bedstone, the scientific position that the world is a very old place. And then we found there are no natural processes that come close to explaining the origin and complexity of the simplest forms of life. And now we have shown in this, this presentation that catastrophe explains many of the features we find in the rocks beneath our feet. In the last presentation, we'll put this together, but there is one more field to consider before that. Next time, we'll be returning to look at life, its diversity and evolution, and the possibility of what's really happening in the world today. So we hope that you'll meet, join us again. And each time we'll be putting and providing a reference list of the sources of this information and also a reading list if you wish to take your thoughts further. I hope you found this presentation helpful.